Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, uh, Jan Veldrop, as uh, I was just introduced, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here and talk you uh, through some of the issues that I find we, we have to deal with when it comes to the amount of uh, material that's being published. And the volume is growing and growing all the time. Um, it is growing in the order of uh, every minute two new articles, and this is just in PubMed. So that gives you an idea of what's going on. Um, the amount is, is growing, and uh, obviously this is something that many people see as information overload. Now, is it indeed information overload, or is it, uh, or should we really uh, interpret it differently? And the way um, uh, I like is, well, is it maybe something, is more information actually a way of enabling us to change course in, in, in finding out um, uh, scientific knowledge? So the purpose of scientific communication is really the dissemination of, uh, of knowledge. You'll know that. And um, the, 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 the core of it is that uh, we really ought to uh, look for the maximal usefulness of scientific uh, research results in an efficient, fast, effective way. Um, now, efficient, is that something that we can live up to? Uh, there's so much material, uh, it really is impossible to read everything. I don't know if you've tried, but it, it's become really impossible these days. And there is also something else. Uh, it may be impossible to read stuff, uh, but if we, if we limit ourselves to what we can read, we have this problem of what I call lamppost research, which is we base what we do, and maybe you know, the hypothesis we, we form, on the basis of what we can see, and that is very analogous to uh, losing the keys somewhere and then looking under the lamppost for them, even though we haven't lost it there, uh, just on, on, on account of the fact that there it's light. Uh, so just looking where it's light, in other words, just looking where uh, we have access to information is not really a very efficient way of doing things. We miss a lot. So um, it's not necessarily the literature we need if we look only at places where we can find it or if we read only the stuff that we can read um, given the limited time we have. So this is about how fast as you have to read if you want to keep up with the literature. Um, I won't ask you questions about this because I'm pretty sure you haven't really read it all. Um, in a, a few years ago, there was this article in the British Medical Journal on the impossibility of being an expert. And in that article, you have to look it up, it's um, basically the argument is made that in a very small discipline of, of uh, cardiac imagery in this case, um, if you really want to be an expert and you read everything that's relevant, that's truly relevant to it, and you start when you're 25, full time, then uh, by the time you're 65 and retiring, you might call yourself an expert just in time, uh, having a day or two to actually apply your knowledge, which is not what you would call uh, a, a very practical way of doing things. Um, now, we use material and we have to realize that we use all the material, or we can use all the material, uh, even without actually reading it. Uh, so, what do we do? Uh, faced with the idea of having so much material, uh, an, an overwhelm, uh, as I call it, of, of material. Now, of course, every problem uh, has its solution, but we have to be aware that uh, this is also true. Uh, so some caveat should apply here. Um, and we have a number of strategies that we could possibly employ. Uh, we could publish a smaller number of papers. Uh, we could just accept that we can only read uh, a limited uh, amount. Or we could capture the knowledge uh, in, in, in a different way, using computers and using the technology that exists in order to, uh, to map knowledge, to create overviews and so on. Now the first one, um, I've heard that too often and I really think it's, it's ludicrous. Uh, 
it's like saying we have all those many notes so uh, we shouldn't produce more music yes we should produce more music uh, yeah, we don't make scientific advances by you know having less information uh, so um, and accepting that um, uh, a smaller proportion of the available literature is something we can read uh, faces another problem how do we make that choice um, so this is what it kind of looks like you know if we we have all that information which ones do you pick you can't eat them all <laughs> if you wish uh, we have this problem of finding finding what we need to find and in any case there is this, this French expression, l'embarras du choix, the, the embarrassment of the choice. We have this phenomenal choice and we have no real ways of choosing. So we have to find different ways of dealing with it. And um, um, we have to find ways of identifying trends, maybe creating overviews. And this is the analogy I'm, I'm taking. The, if you're an, uh, an archaeologist, you don't start digging at random. You take aerial surveys and you make, you know, uh, aerial photos and then you analyze those. And then, in areas that look promising from that analysis, uh, maybe you start you start digging. Uh, and then the chance of finding something significant is, of course, uh, uh, materially enhanced. Still, no guarantee, but you know, uh, you don't spend all your resources and time uh, digging in the wrong place. Um, but then, of course, we have the question, this is all very well for uh, archaeologists, but how do we do that? How do we create overviews? First of all, by having the technology work. <laughs> uh, how do we create overviews um, for the, 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 the scientific literature? There are a number of, of uh, uh, initiatives on the way, and I'm, I'm just looking at, at a few of those. Um, um, this I've taken from a, uh, from a, a project that's called Lazarus, as in resurrecting knowledge that's buried in, uh, in, in the literature. Um, this is a thing in, in, in the, at, at the University of Manchester in, in Britain. And uh, the idea is uh, to use massive computer power to analyze, semantically analyze, uh, uh, large, large numbers of papers and then see if, 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 if some kind of knowledge map can be created, some kind of overview that enables you then to find those bits and pieces that you really need to dig into, uh, home into, and then uh, read. Um, and I think that this is the, the way that publishers can add value. So I'll, I'll amend this a little bit uh, and hope that that is something that can be crossed out. Uh, if, if we except that uh, the whole purpose of it all is to spread knowledge and so on, then I think publishers have a role in making that then easy, making it easy, making it possible even, to create these overviews and to do things that, that are, are uh, uh, valuable to, to science. So one way of doing that is to extract the key insights in the literature. We all know that a lot of the text is matrix, essentially, and there are key phrases, key insights that you can find and can extract from the literature. Now, this is not completely fail-safe. You, know, you will miss a few, or you will uh, extract uh, uh, phrases that look interesting and significant but aren't. But uh, again, we're not looking for answers here. We're looking for uh, increasing the chances of reading or putting our, our efforts into reading stuff uh, that that is then relevant, and um, you know we may still not not you know we may still miss it, but on the other hand, uh, uh, if we if we whittle down thousands of articles, a thousand articles to ten articles that we have to read, uh, then we have gained enormous uh, enormous amounts of time and effort. So uh, I give you a few uh, and not a few one example of how this what this might look like if the technology allows me I don't know what so imagine a paper this is a fake paper of course but imagine a paper that has this conclusion um, you can read it for yourself and then we apply this Lazarus that I referred to earlier this module uh, applies uh, some algorithm to it and then it it 
picks out what the, 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 the software thinks is significant concepts and their relationships. And, th and then it, it um, normalizes them uh, semantically. And then um, it comes with these concepts. So these concepts are well described, and uh, in, in, in the square brackets you uh, you see references to the ontologies uh, uh, or the the uh, uh, thesauri where it uh, is taken from, um, and also in a number of cases you can actually uh, extract the links between these concepts. So aspirin decreases thrombosis and increases myocardial infarctions. Now, if publishers only would do this, add these, these things to the abstract of a paper, then it would be a lot easier uh, subsequently to analyze thousands of articles uh, uh, properly and you know, basically come to a better idea of what they are about. Abstracts alone don't really do that these days. Um, so, um, just in case publishers don't do that, or don't want to do it, or are not able to do it, there are uh, some alternatives uh, being, being developed outside of publishers' control, um, which is, you know, something that publishers should be aware of, uh, that that's the case. Uh, it's not a threat, it's just, you know, reality. Um, when you publish data in articles, it's essentially it is uh, burying those 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 data. Uh, let's face it; you know, it, it, it's, it's rendered then in a, in a, a graph, and then to co go back from the graph to the real data is uh, a nightmare very often. Um, so this Lazarus uh, resurrects the the data from the grave that is uh, publication, and uh, so entities, phrases. But not only those, also, say, molecules, graphs is an important uh, thing, tables, can be, um, can be uh, extracted out of the literature and then uh, uh, connected with one another and connected into a, um, uh, to a knowledge graph, building it up. Uh, the relationships between these, these entities uh, is, is described. And the interesting thing is for a publisher is that all these things then relate back to the DOI of the article in question. So essentially, what these guys are doing is comes down to a reference. And um, give me a publisher who doesn't like references to his or her material. It's uh, so the other thing that it does is it compares whatever the, the, the phrase is uh, that's extracted to instances earlier of exactly the same phrase and by um, exactly the same phrase I mean semantically the same so for instance uh, if a phrase uh, mentions cancer and another one uh, malignant neoplasm f semantically we're really talking about the same thing so what you can do then and what you might want to apply in your peer review mechanisms is to see if a new article is you know has a lot of phrases that are new or phrases that are essentially the same as what, you know, what what a lot of the literature already says, and it gives you an idea of the newness of an article. The other thing is, you can also compare uh, f positive phrases with negative phrases involving the same concepts, and if you see a lot of uh, interactions that uh, are positive, and you see uh, the same number uh, of interactions that are negative, given the same concepts, then you might think, well, maybe scientists, the scientific world doesn't quite know about this yet. This is not really a resolved issue. And that may be very interesting in the, in the whole peer review process. Um, this is what I just said. Um, so how, uh, how Lazarus then subsequently applies, if you wish, a quality control over the whole thing is that it, it uh, uh, allows people who are reading an article to, to uh, uh, what's the word, uh, to, to qualify it or to say, well, yes, this is right or this is really wrong. This is th you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have picked this out. And, and, and the whole process is then a learning process to, to ac actually get these things out. Um, 
And the interesting thing about that is that these are things that people already do anyway. So you're not asking re uh, scientists to do anything more than they are already doing. And the nice thing is that this works in uh, PDFs that you might read. Uh, and if you read PDFs with the Utopia uh, software, then all this stuff is basically automatically done. You don't have to do anything else uh, than read these articles in, uh, in Utopia. Um, it works on any PDF, uh, so if you have uh, a PDF from a paywall publisher, then it still works and the, these things can be extracted, uh, uh, references can be generated and, 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 and linked back to the, to the publisher, to the original. Uh, this is what uh, it looks like. Um, here we have a page, uh, a PDF page, and uh, immediately on the right-hand side you already see what um, you may not be able to read it, but that those are the uh, uh, things extracted in other articles compared to uh, to this particular statement that you find in in this article. Uh, the the green ones are the uh, uh, are the positive ones, and the red ones the negative ones. Uh, here you see you know some of the positive ones. Uh, PVHL binds to uh, uh, HIF. And then uh, you also have a couple of negative ones, not able to bind to HIF. Uh, and this is what I mentioned earlier. So this is a way of looking at, at the literature. Is it consistent? Is it coherent? Uh, or are there still major disputes there? Um, now, um, you add all those things to a, a larger uh, body of, of uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge graph. And, and that can be analyzed, and, uh, uh, and basically uh, that's the way you can, you can uh, uh, identify areas of real interest and home in on that without necessarily having to read the thousands of articles on which it is all based. So uh, my, my analogy here is a little bit uh, 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 taken from, uh, from a hologram. If you have a large number of data uh, and then you shine the right light on it, as it were, uh, you can get a picture. Now, you haven't got enough data, clearly, to make this picture very clear. So, if you add more and more data, then uh, this picture can actually become uh, sharper. Again, if the technology allows me... I don't know what this is. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, you have more data, and then uh, you shine a light, and you have uh, a much sharper picture. And of course, when you have that, you can home in on the detail that really interests you. Now, this is a bit of a funny example, of course, but uh, and I'm not sure if the analogy of, uh, of uh, uh, a hologram really applies, but it's the idea of creating an overview, a sharper overview, a better overview with more data, and then homing in on the articles that really interest you, and uh, uh, that may be, may be worth investing your time into. Uh, it's the choice of what to read, uh, and uh, we faced all of us are faced with that. How to, how to do that? Now it's not just about finding the information. This technology also allows you to recombine uh, knowledge. And uh, an interesting example is this. This is called Brain. I don't know who thought of that uh, that uh, acronym, but Biorelations Intelligent Network. And what it does, it, 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 it finds relations that are not explicitly mentioned in the literature. Uh, and then um, uh, it, 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 it basically uh, tells you, well, this is from that, if you find a relation, this is from that article, or uh, these are the papers from which we, which we recombined and we find this. And the nice thing for a publisher is, of course, that these things uh, uh, are linked or can be linked to the original article. So he again, here we have a reference, uh, uh, a citation, if you wish. And uh, subsequently, you go there and you can pick up the article from the publisher. So I'm just saying that allowing these things to happen, or maybe arranging even these things to happen, can be very beneficial to a publisher. Um, now, this recombinant knowledge, um, can also lead to suggestions as to, well, we found this. It's not described in the literature, but we found a link here between uh, IRAP-1 and uh, Bechet syndrome. 
We don't find it in the literature, but uh, if we combine all these things, it, it, it suggests that there should be a link. And there is an uh, initi initiative on the way now to basically uh, publish this and say, we found this. And uh, we've called it seed articles. Uh, these, these articles are then uh, not really scientific articles, but suggestions as to where, uh, where um, research might lead. And uh, I think we're at the moment talking about 180,000 of those. Um, when or when they will be published and in what form is still not clear. But it gives, it basically puts power in the scientific literature that never was there before unless you read thousands of articles which and then com and then and then remember them all and then combine them in your head which is not really a feasible thing to do um, and we, we did a few tests with these things and uh, they come up very high in in Google if you look for them uh, which is logical because they haven't fa been found in the literature and this is the first time they have been combined in a, in a document so uh, that may actually uh, help uh, help publishers as well to to use that kind of technology to uh, to draw attention to inferences that can be made from their literature. Um, now, once uh, users have identified the articles that they really, really need to read, uh, it should be really made very, very easy for them, which is not necessarily always the case yet. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I'm an I'm an uh, advocate of open access, at least that makes it openly available. But uh, that's just one thing. Uh, I think what publishers also should do is make sure that it's horses for courses. Uh, one one uh, format doesn't necessarily always work. So publishers should really make it available in HTML, uh, XML, PDF, mobile format, and even uh, on demand if there's demand uh, in print or at least make it possible that that demand can be fulfilled. And mobile devices are really uh, coming up very, very fast, uh, and even in science. And uh, to, to have your stuff, not if, if, you, if you have the right XML, to have it also in mobile form is actually easier than you think. So I give you an example of a company that I'm aware of, and they're called ResearchPad. Um, it, it's worthy while looking it up. I think, and they uh, they render the XML in true mobile formats, uh, and it gives you all, all manner of possibilities. I don't know if you can read this, um, uh, but it gives you. I'll give you a few examples. You can build a collection of favorites in there, favorite articles. Uh, you can, uh, you know, then subsequently call up the full text and read it. Uh, you can share. Uh, oh, oh, you, you can see the, the, all the, 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 the metrics there, uh, they, they, they show up as well, it, and this is all live, uh, and you can share it with others, um, you can have a, uh, a list of favorite journals, not just articles, but journals that you want to be alerted on, or you can uh, have alerts on, on favorite terms or concepts uh, that... Uh, uh, you know, you, you might want to follow, and uh, instead of doing the search every day, you automatically get uh, an alert if these things uh, come up in the literature that is rendered in this in this way. Uh, it's in their words. I've taken this from their presentation. Um, it's a platform that they offer to publishers, and uh, I think publishers are well advised to take a look at these things. Um, um, this is another uh, slide taken from them. Apparently, uh, it's th the way they can do it is really fast, and uh, it doesn't take very much to get there. Um, so, uh, what I find very interesting uh, in this is as well is that they have a lot of open access material already in that platform, and what they can do apparently is to uh, combine all that with your own material. So, what you offer. It's not your own material only, but your own material plus all the open access material that's available in the areas that you choose. So it's open access material, but it can be accessed directly via your own platform, your own branded platform. And I think that, that is a very nice uh, uh, service to your customers. Uh, and I don't think it, it, it costs anything more to do that. Once you have that platform also, you can have 
all the open access material, and that's growing all the time, included in your offering. Um, so uh, there is a, uh, an open access edition uh, f uh, and f that is uh, uh, said free for, for uh, researchers and uh, that's running at the moment. Uh, inspect it if you wish. And this is really all I wanted to say. Thank you very much.